it's time for you to make a change, whether it be technology or provider or just scrubbing everything down to the base and starting over again. But what do you need to know in order to make that happen efficiently for you and your team? In this episode of the On-Premise IT Podcast, we ask, are you afraid of vendor switch? Welcome to the On-Premise IT Podcast, the only podcast that dares to be both on topic and on location. My name is Tom Hollingsworth, and as a part of Gestalt IT, each episode we bring you the perspectives and opinions of a group of IT luminaries, real experts in their field, on a variety of subjects. But we try to keep it on topic or on premise. Let's jump into today's episode, but first I want to introduce our guests so you know who you're talking to, starting with Keith. Hi, Keith Parsons. Uh, I run a company called Wireless Land Professionals. We do Wi-Fi consulting as well as put on the uh, Wireless Land Professionals Conference. And happy to be here with you, Tom. Yeah, hey, I'm Mike Belitho. I'm based out of Phoenix. I work for a very large healthcare system, and I'm a wireless engineer. So thanks for having me, Tom. Hey, Tom. And Mike and Keith. Uh, Lee Badman, uh, by day I work for a large private university. Uh, primary job is wireless network architect, but I do a lot of other things. And then off on the side for a couple of decades now, I've been fortunate to be a pretty active freelance writer uh, for networking topics. And uh, thank you for having me. No problem. Thank you all for joining us. Let's jump into the premise for today's episode. You've invested a lot of money in companies to come in and install equipment could be hardware, it could be software, it could be a combination of all of the above. Maybe it's even services. But now you're starting to ask questions. Do I really need all this stuff? It's getting kind of old. Is it time for me to upgrade it? Or do I need to look at somebody else that may be offering something better, faster, cheaper, easier? But I'm not sure. There's a lot of decision making that has to go into switching from one vendor to another. So I guess the premise for this episode is, are you afraid of the vendor switch? Now, we've collectively installed a lot of equipment over the years, and I would be remiss if I didn't say as a reseller, I not only displaced a lot of other people's equipment, I may have tried to convince people to keep the equipment they had and maybe just get a slightly faster horse that eats a little less hay. But I want to kind of throw it back to you guys, because it has been about a decade since I've actually done an equipment install do you feel like people are afraid of switching from one vendor to another? I'll start off there. I think people are afraid, definitely afraid, but it's all a matter of pain and how much tolerance they have. Usually they get to a point where there's so much pain with vendor A that they decide we've got to switch something else. But I would also say this isn't only just about switching vendors, it's sometimes switching technologies, going from controller-based to non-controller. And that, that too has its same pain, and then you're looking for that relief of the pain. And so, like many things in life, it's we're trying to have pain avoidance, and there's fear that it still it might even hurt worse than what it is now. And Keith, to that point, I would actually like to point out that a lot of times that we see these kinds of conversations about switching technologies, switching vendors, they usually kind of go hand in hand. It's, well, if I'm going to make this big jump from, I don't know, 802.11n to 802.11ac, if I'm going to have to deal with the pain now, I might as well get all of the pain out of the way up front and move from you know, vendor C to vendor M or vendor E to vendor A or, you know, whoever it happens to be. So do you feel like people are kind of, it's it's the rip the bandaid off effect where it's like, well, if I'm going to be hurting, I might as well hurt all at once. I've seen multiple cases of that, that they just like, once we're going to go, let's just go. Other times they're like, well, we want to hold on to one piece, maybe maybe the their switch fabric and their cable plant and say, as long as you don't touch this, you can change anything else you want on the wireless side. Or other times it's let's let's do that. Or with in the edu and K-12 market, if there's money, sometimes the money is tied to switching one thing or all things. So a lot of times it's also money-based. Not to mention, sometimes the vendors are very... Um, generous in their discounts if you're willing to make bigger moves. Yeah, so I would um, agree with what Keith said in the beginning, change is hard, it's always uncomfortable. And I think that alone keeps a lot of people uh, faithful to one vendor, regardless of their 
uh, satisfaction or they kind of convince themselves that they're satisfied, whether they really are or not, because changing is just uncomfortable. But for me uh, personally, you know, I've tried to, I've tried to be a wireless expert, not a vendor, a expert, always looking for the right technology for the situation. You know, for example, years and years and years ago, I found out that for uh, our branch solutions, there was a much better uh, overall solution than we were using in our biggest, um, you know, mothership network. Uh, so, you know, it's like, let's go to that for the branch, because in the branch, it is a much better fit. And, and that worked out very well. And that kind of gave uh, some courage when it came time to, like you said, Tom, uh, we're about to move to 11AX. It's a big change. You know, we're kind of not real thrilled with some of the cultural aspects of the, you know, vendor A we were using for a lot of years for our mothership network. We had proven that we can make the change in our branches. So we did a lot of soul searching to find our requirements and found that, yes, indeed, we could move to vendor B and uh, it worked. So, you know, it, it can be done. I won't say it was without discomfort, even after the fact, we're still finding there's little uh, things like reporting and all of that. You're so ingrained to what you got out of vendor A. When you get to vendor B, even if you're happy with the change, it's still change. And you're gonna find things that just aren't what you're used to seeing, aren't what you're used to consuming. So the, there's a secondary period of discomfort, if that makes any sense. Yeah, Lee, you know, you touched on something where you said you try to be not a vendor A or vendor B guy, but a wireless guy. <clears throat> and um, I think like that, we see that a lot, like at a, at a higher level. Um, and I think what what a lot of companies are afraid of is from an operational perspective, um, when you look at your ops guys, especially at scale, it's like, are they really vendor agnostic or are these guys vendor A, you know, like brought up? learn certifications, all that, or they vendor B. I think there's some fear there too, is your operational support. So that kind of comes into another, another thing I think about too, is, you know, when a lot of companies have like that single throat to choke model, you know? And so for us, especially with wireless, you, you can run vendor B on top of vendor A and it doesn't really matter um, from a wireless perspective. We, we can be agnostic as to who's backhauling us, but, a lot of companies don't like to do that. They want to stay with just one vendor across the stack. And one thing I want to ask kind of related to that, because Lee said, you know, we did some soul searching and there were things that we liked and there were things we need to change. How do you quantify some of that? Because obviously one of the things that I dealt with in education was the quantification process was which one was cheaper. Because to them, the money was what was important. It didn't matter if you had to retrain your people or, you know, suddenly a feature didn't work. But how do you put that into a scoring system to say, well, you know, <laughs> we need to know this command line interface to be able to work on these things. Or here is a feature that reporting is a good example that ranks so highly in our system that you need to have a reporting structure at least this robust or we won't even consider you. Because one of the other things that I see a lot in, in conversations with people is this idea that there are solutions that can give you 85 or 90% of another solution for half the price but it's not considered to be, you know, a robust enterprise deployment. It's more along the lines of effectively like prosumer, which is great for a small office or great for a medium sized office, but you would never deploy it to 15 sites. Yeah, I mean, I can touch on the uh, how do you quantify it a little bit? And I can only speak again for you know, my own experience. Um, you know, basically what drove a change for us was just being fed up with bugs, you know, everybody comes out with a dashboard, the dashboard's supposed to give you end to end views of all the problems that you have to be having because we gave you a dashboard. So we're gonna find problems and show you lots of, lots of things. Um, problem is the dashboards don't show when the system itself has bugs. And that's what we got burned out on. You know, you're gonna get a bug, open up a tech case, go through days or weeks of trying to figure out what's up ultimately end up with a controller upgrade pretty much each and every time. Don't have wireless problems, have code problems. And the culture from vendor A seemed to be such that 
that's just the way we do business. And, you know, that's supported by talking to lots of other customers in the same boat. For us, it was just enough is enough. Looking forward at the next generation of products from vendor A, it just felt like there wasn't really a cultural change uh, behind the scenes that was going to bring an end to that pain. So that was a big part of the decision to say it, it's time to move on. Um, you know, and you know, we were also getting more, we were also getting more, sorry, Keith, we are also getting more cloud centric in a lot of ways. So that did <clears throat> influence the decision a little bit, but. How did you quantify, you, you talked about making the decision to leave vendor A, what were your, what were your metrics for choosing vendor B, C, D, or E? Uh, a lot of, well, first defining, redefining, re making sure we still understood our own requirements. And uh, that alone ended up ruling out a couple of vendors because they just couldn't do a couple of our major requirements related to the layer two aspects of putting together a big uh, wireless network, or at least they couldn't do them to our satisfaction. So that whittled down the field. And then a lot of uh, talking to other customers, a lot of talking to other not just cherry picked case studies, but going out and finding our own vendor B uh, people to talk about and uh, seeing how it was going for them, especially customers that were uh, like uh, us in uh, size and, you know, client type served and, you know, operations, that sort of thing. So it was a lot of uh, testimonial based, um, you know, confidence gathering for lack of a better phrase. One of the things I've tried with some of my customers is to do a proof of concept. The problem with proof of concepts that I've seen, they're either too small or they're not the exact same. They're not comparing apples and apples. So it sounds like a good thing. Oh, just, just put in vendor B, put in vendor C, run them both, compare the differences. The problem is that's a huge learning curve for B and C, even before you made a, a commitment. So I was just wondering if you'd done any of those kind of proof of concepts in that, in your process uh yeah we did absolutely did do a proof of concept um you know basically took uh the most important building at least from an it perspective and uh you know how, how does this feel in that building where you know our uh, it command structure works every day and that went well and at the same time uh, having been around the block a few times you know that it's not at scale you know, 35 APs is not 5,000 APs. So 35 is going to feel different than 5,000, but there's only so much you can do. So that was uh, part of our um, approach, but, you know, it was also kept in context. Uh, feels great at the small scale. <laughs> Hopefully it feels as good at the big scale. And we have heard from other people at the big scale that are, you know, have gone there and, you know, answering all of our questions and, assuaging any of our fears about, you know, how is this going to feel at big scale? So, so uh, Lee, I kind of assume you guys didn't just forklift everything in one night. Um, you know, like a fear that, that someone our size, what, what we kind of worry about is a multi vendor environment with, with the wireless. Um, how did you guys overcome those challenges? Uh, well, being a campus of 300 ish buildings, uh, we're, basically able to go building by building, um, which is very helpful. And if we have a situation where over a few days, you know, it's going to be vendor A and vendor B both uh, maybe on interspersed floors, or for some reason we can only do half the building on day one and the other half has to get done on day two uh, or three, whatever. Uh, we make sure that we, uh, you know, communicate well with the people in those spaces that it may be a little wonky for a day or two. If you bounce between the systems and, you know, but also trying to work, you know, outside of normal hours and all of that, but building by building, not trying to, uh, being very purposeful about not having uh, overlapped as much as we can help it has basically been the, the main thrust to how we um, have dealt with it. I, I found sometimes in these big changes, it's also a good time to do a redesign like you said, Lee, you have to go back to what are the requirements. Uh, many times I've seen requirements change over just five years to like substantially different from the original, which means a redesign, which means most likely new cable pulls. So it, it sometimes these little changes, we think we're just going to change a vendor. 
there's there's cascading effects that go into other places too that you have to kind of think through and getting new cable sometimes changes like your entire timeline so i, I guess the question is did you also redesign as you're changing your vendor yeah that's a great question so uh all through vendor a we've try to be mindful of the growth and, you know, client devices and space changes and all of that. But basically in each case, before we moved from vendor A to vendor B in a specific building, uh, ran a series of reports on just client counts and uh, examined any kind of quantity of trouble tickets and all of that to get a sense of, is there anything fundamentally wrong here? Is there a place where even if we're not even if we don't have reported troubles, it's just obvious there's too many clients per AP uh, for a number of different reasons. And that's going to depend on, you know, what kind of uh, business you are, or what, what your daily operations are. So um, we haven't, we have not had the need to do wholesale uh, redesigns, but we absolutely have had buildings where, you know, vendor on vendor A, we're leaving it, we're leaving that, um, you know, say a hundred APs behind and with vendor B, there's going to end up being 110 or 115 or 105, whatever, because um, we are doing due diligence to make sure that we're kind of um, addressing a couple of problems as we go, not just changing vendors, but improving, um, you know, targeted areas that obviously need improvement. But to your point, I mean, we're just not, we are not wholesale, have not ha had wholesale changes of what we do that call for redesign. Um, but if it was needed, yeah, absolutely. It, it's the right time to do it. You know, the last thing you want to do is count on vendor B to solve all of your problems, but you're just bringing forward, you know, problems from vendor A because it's not, the design is expired or it's not what it should be anymore for whatever reason. So yeah, I, I hear what you're saying and fully agree that that is a absolutely a viable and potentially necessary uh, possibility when you're changing. Yeah. And I, I would, you know, hope that that wouldn't be too much of a barrier for people if they are considering changing vendors, because we should be looking at that anyway, we're coming with six gigahertz now and we're, we have to look at everything full top down capacities looking different. Um, bandwidth requirements are completely different. You're probably going to have to upgrade your, your structured cabling because it can't necessarily handle it. We got POE, all these APs are coming with so many radios now. We look at our POE requirements. So, you know, that's something that as wireless engineers, we need to be looking at regardless, you know, continuing to come back to our sites every couple of years and doing these audits. So hopefully that's not a barrier to switching. Um, we should be doing it anyway, I think. I think that adjusts the original premise that it's, we sh we're, we're afraid of change, not just changing vendors, the changing technology, the change in requirements, all of those are, are scary. But again, I think it comes back to the pain of today versus the pain that you're going to feel in the change. And hopefully you'll feel better afterward. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned switches, uh, Mike. I, I've come to view, you know, a lot of times you refresh your Ethernet switches just with, you know, whatever the next one in the series is or whatever the next generation, again, from vendor A is. And if you zoom out, a lot of people, uh, Ethernet switch nowadays is just a really glorified PoE brick in a lot of cases. And I'm starting to question, you know, is it even worth time time to start thinking about changing switch vendors to something very inexpensive because mostly it's POE and very unsophisticated use of, you know, VLANs or whatever, and not doing 95% of the built-in feature sets with the, uh, you know, costly new licensing paradigms that a lot of vendors are throwing at even their switches anymore. So it's, it's just an interesting time with what Silicon Valley is doing uh, in a lot of regards, trying to, you know, make more money for the shareholders with licensing and all of that. It really has me rethinking a lot of, a lot of things, you know, whether the changes actually happen or not, I'm, I'm certainly thinking about them. I mean, do I need a switch that does, a hundred things if I'm only doing 95 of them and is there a good viable alternative? You know, it's a, that's kind of comes after the wireless part of this. And I guess a good question there would be, do you feel like it's necessary to continually upgrade the technology to be on the cutting edge or is there kind of a, I don't know, a uh, basic level of technology that you can just sit on for a while? I mean, we, we talk about this a lot with things that are a lot more, um, uh, 
the whole new release cycles like phones and stuff like that. You know, do we feel like we have to continually upgrade those devices every year or is this something that can wait one refresh cycle or two refresh cycles? Because of course we know the answer is going to be that if someone needs to make a sale, they're going to be trying to get us to buy new equipment. You know, do we, do we have to make those considerations as well to ensure that we're not just upgrading for the sake of upgrading, that there's a valid reason to do that? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, for us in healthcare, we tend to lag behind a little bit because we want things to be rock solid, right? Super proven. We've got actual lives at risk here. Um, so we tend to lag a little bit. Um, but you know, with, you know, a lot of vendors, they EOL hardware so fast that, you know, you're, you're no longer on like a seven year refresh cycle because you've got APs that are now end of life and a support and they you might have just bought them three or four years ago um so that's a challenge too and i think something worth looking at um when you're looking at switching vendors is what does their end of life policy kind of look like what's their hardware train look like are they forcing you to are they are they gonna say say hey we're done with 6e you're putting in you know wi-fi 7 ap's sorry we're not even selling the 6 E's anymore so that's something to consider as well well, I, I think it with a lot of my customers, it still goes back to what are the requirements. And uh, I, I was with a hotel chain a little while ago and they were like, well, we need to go to, and they had all these ideas because obviously salespeople have been talking to them and they're like, but, but we need Netflix. I mean, that's what people want. And I'm like, okay. And, and how much is it? And what does it require? Well, we need about four, four megabytes for, per user and like, okay, Wi-Fi one, if you want to go back that far, gave us six gigahertz, uh, sorry, six megabits of throughput, which is more than enough to deliver Wi-Fi. So the question isn't, I mean, the worst possible Wi-Fi ever will still support Netflix. So it's not how far back do you want to go? It's now how many of those Netflix do you want? And depending on the size of the hotel, 807G can fulfill their requirements in many, many places. And not that I'm suggesting anyone go back to and put in old stuff. It's just when you look at your requirements, look at them very diligently to find out, is the solution going to solve the requirement or is the solution just part of the upgrade process? And if you, you can make that decision, I, it's okay to move to new stuff, even if you didn't need it for requirements, as long as you're talking and cognizant about it. It's when, when you believe what the vendors say, you have to go to multi-gig switches because your APs require it and you look at your traffic flows and they're no, you know, you're not needing it. So just, just look at your requirements very closely if you can. Yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, just two, two parts of that. We know, we know that for, for who we are, there's a lot of 6E capable clients coming, even if they're not out there today. And our life cycle uh, opportunities, refresh opportunities from a budget perspective, you know, we can do 500 every so often. And, you know, we, we're, we need to stage it based on when we can fund it. And the last thing that you want to do is put in something that you know is going to be uh, obsolete uh, sooner rather than later. So a lot of times we push the cutting edge and you don't have to even turn on all the cutting edge features that's the other part about it you can get the hardware and wait for the code to stabilize and catch up if you so choose but from a refresh perspective the labor of doing uh, the refresh when you when your ap's are measured in the thousands and thousands and you're not the government with a you know bottomless money you have to do a, a cycling and a, uh, staging phased approach to this. So, you know, you just don't want to put in obsolescence. So there's a, there's a couple of points to that answer or something that's going to be uh, obsolete sooner than if you went with the latest greatest, even if you don't feel like you need the latest greatest necessarily. So I guess the big question now is for those people who are out there that are looking to make a change, maybe they're wanting to move from one technology area to another, Maybe they're wanting to move from one vendor to another. Maybe they're wanting to completely overhaul everything. What would be one piece of advice that you would give them based on your experience that will help alleviate their fears and give them a path forward to making this the smoothest transition possible? Being afraid is natural, but talk to other people who've been there ahead of you and you'll see there is light at the end of the tunnel. 
you can make pain go away today. You'll have a little pain getting there, but in the end, you you it, talk to other people who've done it before you, and you will find that there is light out there. Trust. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, another part of that is, are you not considering a change of vendor just because you're thoroughly all you've ever known is vendor A, and you are afraid to spread your wings, regardless of whether there's better technology out there. If that's the case, yeah, you might want to get some therapy, and <laughs> grow up a little bit, and you know realize it is a much bigger world than when you started and, and got that comfort. There are a lot of good options out there that may be beyond your comfort level, and if you can stretch the payoff, there is a payoff to stretching and, and being at least you know, able to look beyond what you're used to for sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I haven't done like a full blown switch from vendor A to vendor B before, but you know, we have started to put in a, a subset of vendor A um, in some of our other facilities. And yeah, there, there's some, there's some learning curves there and things are done differently. Um, you got to get used to things like APIs and, and stuff like that. And it, it, it can be scary at the beginning, but yeah, like like both Keith and Lee have said that there might be a little bit of pain at the beginning, but it ends up being good in the long run. You got to do what's best for what your requirements are. And I think that that's really a lot of where this comes down to is this idea that change is bad for us and we don't like it. We're going to resist it as much as possible, whether it's upgrading code or upgrading equipment or upgrading to a different vendor or or what have you. We have to make reasonable, rational decisions. We have to create ways to rank what are what's important to us and what we need. And we have to be honest with ourselves when we do that. If the only differentiation is the price, then be honest about that. You know, we don't care what it looks like. We don't care how fast it performs as long as it's cheaper. But if there's more to it than that, rank what is important to you. Make sure you're making an informed decision. And don't be afraid to ask questions to make people justify why their solution is a better fit for what you do. Because remember, when you're done with this, you have to live with it until it's time to make that decision again. And you don't want to be stuck with something that you really don't want to deal with. That'll just about do it for this episode of the On-Premise IT Podcast. I want to thank each of you for joining us. Remember, we have a new episode about every two weeks. You can always find the latest episode on our website, gestaltit.com, our YouTube channel, Gestalt IT Video, as well as your favorite podcast application of choice. Just search for Gestalt IT Podcast or On-Premise IT Podcast. We should be back in another two weeks with another great episode. Until then, take care of yourselves. And remember, stay on-premise.